It wasn't until a conversation with a childhood friend um, that I realized the true depth of my research. And here's what she said. I've been very fortunate, but it's definitely because I try to exercise and eat well. But it hasn't always been this good. I've lost my vision in the past and my ability to walk. But obviously I've got it back. I have relapse remitting multiple sclerosis. So I'm fine 90% of the time. But yeah, that other 10%. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks the healthy neurons of the patient's central nervous system. This renders the neuron incapable of communicating signals to the rest of the body. The damaged and scarred tissue of the neuron is called an MS lesion, and we can visualize these using magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. In analyzing different scans, we see a very distinct pattern between the lesions and the healthy tissue. And currently, radiologists use this pattern to outline the lesions manually, calling it a segmentation. Now, this is important in all stages of MS, such as initial diagnosis, evaluation of disease progression, and determining treatment efficacy. However, <coughs> manual segmentation is difficult and often variable. Two physicians may not agree on the same segmentation. As well, a physician may not segment the lesion the same way twice, and this results in human error. Therefore, it has been proposed to segment lesions automatically using machine learning. Now, machine learning has become a hot topic in recent years. It's literally everywhere, recognizing and learning patterns and information around us. Google, Facebook, and now Apple's own iPhone uses machine learning for facial recognition. As well, our email inboxes use <laughs> machine learning to filter out spam. We could use a machine learning algorithm to learn the pattern of lesions in these four scans. But first, what information are we looking at in these images? What is this data exactly? Well, a picture is a matrix of pixel intensities at a given X and Y coordinate. We then can stack the images on top of each other, making a third dimension so we can visualize the data and tissue in 3D. This then turns the pixel intensity into a volumetric intensity, or a voxel, in a given x, y, and z coordinate. So if we were looking at these voxels ourselves, and we wanted to try and identify what tissue we're looking at, how would we figure that out? Well, let's make it a little bit simpler. If we were looking at any kind of object, how would we recognize what we're looking at? Say, for example, animals. We could build a dictionary of examples in our memory that we could reference. And it turns out that a computer can do the same, so that it could identify a gorilla from a lion. In dictionary learning, we take a collection of image examples, and we take the pixel intensities, and we rearrange them into a vector. We then place those vector examples side by side into a new matrix that we call a dictionary. Then we can identify a test subject by using regression analysis. Now, this just means that we try to recreate the test subject by using a select amount of dictionary examples. So if a dictionary of lions tried to identify a gorilla, it wouldn't do a very good job, and the error would be large. But if it tried to identify a lion, the error would be small, declaring that it is indeed perceiving a lion. In the case of MS, we want to look at the individual voxels and determine what kind of tissue we're looking at. Specifically, gray matter, white matter, cerebral spinal fluid, and MS lesions. 
So we could build the dictionary for all four. The question now is, how will we characterize each individual voxel to build examples in our dictionary? We're not looking at a whole picture anymore, we're just looking at a small portion of it. Well, classically researchers have taken a large spatial patch of the voxel intensities that surround the voxel of interest. So the voxel of interest is in the center, and then we take all the information around <coughs> it. We would rearrange that information into a vector and then build our dictionaries. So let's see how well this turns out. This is a picture of the ground truth. This is the correct answer. This is what we want to see the algorithm recreate. And these are the results we get. It turns out it doesn't do a very good job. There's a lot of over-segmentation and a lot of false positives. My supervisor, Dr. Hame Zhu, and I looked at this critically and thought it must be looking at too much information at once, resulting in too many confusing factors. So we thought, why not just keep it simple? Let's just use the voxel in question and not a spatial patch. So we tried this out, and it segmented the lesions perfectly. Now, we were a little skeptical about these results because we actually had pre-processed our data to be ideal. We took out any noise or distortions in the images that may make the information confusing <coughs> to the computer. So we thought, why not step it up another level, make it harder, and try and segment images with 3% noise added. And it couldn't handle the noise and our false positives returned. To solve this problem, we asked ourselves, what is the noise changing in these photos? If we take a look at them side by side, we can see that the lines are a little bit blurry, but the biggest difference is between the lines. We can see that the white matter and cerebral spinal fluid have gone from one solid color to a fuzzy pattern. So if you were looking at this fuzzy pattern, how would you describe it? I'll make it a little bit simpler. How would you describe the difference between these images? Each panel has a very distinct texture. The texture of asphalt is contrastingly different than the texture of a brick wall. Therefore, our brains understand what we're looking at. We subconsciously analyze the texture, and it turns out again, a computer can do the same. By looking at the pixel intensities, we can count how often a certain <coughs> intensity level shows up in the picture. By counting the frequency of each intensity level, we get a probability distribution. Then we can calculate the mean, the standard deviation, the entropy, and all sorts of information. We wanted to build a dictionary for all the tissues that uses the voxel intensity in question and a texture quantification calculated statistically from the adjacent voxels to the voxel of interest. Now, as it turns out, as you increase the noise, the standard deviation will increase, but the mean will stay relatively the same. Since the standard deviation is so sensitive to the noise, we coupled it with the voxel intensity and rebuilt our dictionaries. And it solved the problem. It could even segment small lesions that are hard to find. Now, these are very exciting results, but unfortunately it might be a while before this becomes clinical use. The results that I've shown you today were calculated on a simulated brain scan from McGill University called BrainWeb. And papers that have made the jump from simulated data to real patient data have dropped in accuracy by almost 50%. I currently at this moment do not have a database of real patient data to test on. And the approval of a clinical trial to acquire such data set depends on one imminent issue, accountability. 
When a scan is segmented manually for lesions, a physician is diagnosing the lesions. If the segmentation was done automatically, who is doing the diagnosing now? This is the big issue with introducing machine learning to medicine. Now, in the case of dictionary learning, the machine makes a decision based off of the dictionary it was provided with. Therefore, it's like a trained assistant, but it's the doctor who needs to make the final decision. It's not a question of will the machine make the wrong choice, but will the doctor allow the machine to make the wrong choice? Thank you.